Hello and welcome to the webinar, Management During Difficult Times, Supporting Workers and Families to Prevent Burnout and Promote Well-Being. Continuing Education is available. Um, you can access the Continuing Education information through the cdc.gov link provided here or on our Total Worker Health webinar page. So now I will pass it over to our moderator for this webinar, Jeannie Nigam. Thank you very much. And welcome to the NIOSH Total Worker Health webinar series. The topic of our discussion today is management during difficult times, supporting workers and families to prevent burnout and promote well-being, which is a timely topic for this month because October is National Work and Family Month and also Mental Awareness Month, with October 10th having been World Mental Health Day. My name is Jeannie Nigam, and it's my pleasure to serve as the moderator for today's webinar. On behalf of the NIOSH Total Worker Health Program, we are delighted to have you with us today. Today we will be hearing from two speakers, Dr. Gwen Fisher and Corey Berkey. Dr. Gwen Fisher is an Associate Professor of Industrial Organizational Psychology at Colorado State University, an Adjunct Associate Professor in the Department of Environmental and Occupational Health in the Colorado School of Public Health, a NIOSH Center of Excellence in Total Worker Health. Dr. Fisher is also the President-Elect of the Society for Occupational Health Psychology. Her research examines how work and individual factors relate to worker health, well-being, and retirement. Our second speaker, Corey Berkey, is the Vice President of Human Resources at Jazz HR. Jazz HR is a powerful, user-friendly, and affordable recruiting software that helps growing companies exceed their recruiting goals. In his role at Jazz HR, Corey oversees the recruiting efforts that help Jazz HR build a world-class team and is responsible for employee engagement that helps keep that team happy. Corey holds a senior certified professional designation from the Society for Human Resource Management and has been in the field for 10 years. His experience spans large and small businesses and many different industries, but he's always had a soft spot for tech and early stage companies. To introduce our speakers, I'd like to take a few minutes to provide a brief overview and lay the foundation for today's presentations. So let's start with a few fast facts. The percentage of U.S. adults in extreme distress rose from 3.6% in 1993 to 6.4% in 2019. One in five U.S. adults experience mental illness each year. One in 25 U.S. adults experience serious mental illness each year, and one in six U.S. youth ages 6 to 17 experience a mental health disorder each year. 61% of Americans say work is a significant source of stress for them, and at least 20% or more of workers say that, often, that work often or always interferes with their family lives. As you all are keenly aware, we're living in a rather tumultuous time. This year alone, we've had devastating earthquakes and hurricanes. People have had to evacuate their homes due to flooding and in the West due to raging wildfires. There's been a reawakening and widespread unrest around systemic racism and social injustice, political division and conflict, and we continue to face significant threats to public health, most notably the COVID-19 pandemic and sometimes less recognized threats to mental health. Data collected by MetLife in their annual U.S. Employee Benefits Survey collected at the beginning of the pandemic in April of this year show that 34% of workers feel tired and 37% of workers feel stressed more than half the time when they are at work. 27% report feeling burned out, 22% are discouraged, and 17% are depressed, again, more than half the time while they are actually at work. Oops, sorry. There we go. 
As the boundaries between work and home are increasingly less distinct, it has become more difficult and perhaps less meaningful to try to disentangle whether the factors that determine health and well-being are explicitly work-related or personal, because work and life are interdependent, as are certainly mental and physical health. You cannot have one without the other. And therefore, perhaps not surprisingly, data from Sherm's National Study of the Changing Workforce shows that 46% of men and 43% of women experience work-life conflict on a regular basis. And now, considering what we're currently experiencing, two out of three employees are feeling more stressed than before working at home during the height of pandemic shutdowns, 37% reported working longer hours. And this increased stress is really taking a toll, with about half of people surveyed saying that their behavior has been negatively affected, that they may snap or get angry more quickly that they experience unexpected mood swings or have screamed at a loved one. So perhaps now more than ever, employers need to consider comprehensive approaches to protecting and promoting the health of our workforce and helping them balance work and life demands. Which brings us to the total worker health approach. For those of you who may be new to the concept of total worker health, the formal definition is policies, programs, and practices that integrate protection from work-related safety and health hazards with promotion of injury and illness prevention efforts to advance worker well-being. So the fundamental well-being. Employers that follow a total worker health approach recognize the need to first and foremost keep workers safe, but they don't stop there. They invest in the health, safety, and well-being of workers, which includes workers' physical, psychological, social, and financial well-being. Total Worker Health considers the role of the psychosocial work environment along with organizational policies, programs, and practices, and how they can work together to support worker health and well-being, both on and off the job. Total Worker Health is a comprehensive approach that promotes facilitation and integration among the various departments and programs at work that play a role in protecting workers and promoting their well-being. This can include and is not limited to occupational health, organizational design, ergonomics, labor union efforts, occupational safety, workers' comp, human resources, and management. safe and has broadened our focus to look at all factors that influence health, including those that emanate within the workplace and outside of it. As such, Total Worker Health emphasizes and values taking a comprehensive, holistic approach to well-designed work, noting that how workers are treated at work affects them in their lives off the job and vice versa. Total Worker Health recognizes that how workers are employed matters whether or not the employment contract and work arrangements meet the workers' needs and what benefits are provided matters. We pay attention to the psychosocial aspects of work and view improving work organization as a key opportunity to improve worker health. And we strongly believe in allowing workers to participate in the decisions that affect them and that work should be flexible and supportive. In the end, having healthy workers benefits everyone. Workers who are attribute to their family's livelihood, and it's good for the community that the individual lives in, works in, and contributes to in a number of ways, politically, economically, socially. And workers bring their well-being back to the workplace the next day. So the workplace benefits as well, with fewer injuries, less health care spending, more productivity and engagement, and a happier worker who interacts better with his or her coworkers. So this is a win-win for everyone. Certainly, the COVID-19 pandemic has disrupted our personal lives and work in ways we've never imagined, which presents challenges for employers and workers. People have been sick, have lost loved ones, have lost their jobs, or are dealing with economic uncertainty. People are worried about how to care for their family members, and many are facilitating remote learning while still doing their own jobs. The health of workers directly affects the health of their families. And we know that mental and physical health are in. So today, 
we're going to hear from two experts who will share complementary perspectives on what can be done to support workers during difficult times. And at this time, I will turn it over to Dr. Gwen Fisher. to make this happen. It is my pleasure to be here with you today. My name is Gwen Fisher and I am an associate professor in the Department of Psychology at Colorado State University and an adjunct associate professor in the Department of Occupational and Environmental Health at the Colorado School of Public Health. Um, I, this is just a, a photo of me taken a, a few years ago for those of you um, who don't know me and were not acquainted. I also want to acknowledge and give particular thanks to two of our graduate students, our doctoral students in psychology at Colorado State University. Rebecca Clancy and Adeline Shimizu have worked with me and developed a portion of the presentation that I'm sharing with you today. So I wanna make sure that I give credit where credit is due. They are trainees in our NIOSH-funded Mountain and Plains Education and Research Center. Additionally, I just want to thank uh, NIOSH for hosting this webinar today and also to my colleagues and the support that I received from the Center for Health, Work, and Environment at the Colorado School of Public Health, which is a NIOSH Center of Excellence in Total Worker Health. My own research focuses on individual and work factors that relate to employee health and well-being and work family and work non-work issues is a large part of it. There are three things that I hope to accomplish in the next little while that I'll be speaking with you today. By the end of my presentation, I hope that you'll be able to explain the work stress process and how work and family or work non-work issues relate to stress. Secondly, you should be able to identify both workplace and personal challenges that can lead to strains. I will be speaking a little bit in particular about some of the unique factors happening with the COVID pandemic right now and how that has unfortunately exacerbated the stress process and increased the extent to which many, many workers are experiencing more stress due to work family conflict. And finally, by the end of my presentation, you should be able to identify and explain some evidence-based strategies for improving worker well-being. Between my presentation and Corey's, it is our sincere hope that by the end of our webinar today that you will have some clear ideas and strategies for what we can do on the practical side to address and resolve For those of you not familiar with a basic work stress process, this is a stressor strain model. And so stress is a process that unfolds over time and causes of stress in the research literature are what re are referred to as stressors. Stressors can and often do lead to negative outcomes, which are called strains. Often if we just talk about stress, there is ambiguity about whether that's referring to the causes of stress or the outcomes of stress. So in research, we, we really want to disentangle that and, and separate the causes from the outcome. Many of, there are many different causes of work-related, the work-related stress process. There are many different stressors and I'll be talking about a few of those today with the focus on work, non-work, or work family issues given the focus and the topic and with this being work and family month. Uh, it's important to note that not all stress necessarily results in negative outcomes and that's because each of us has different perceptions, different levels of re resilience and things happening that may help or, or serve to buffer those perceptions and those experiences. Also, it, it's important to note that there are some things that are of benefit that we can do to intervene so that not all stressors we experience necessarily lead to negative outcomes. Common work-related stressors include having a high workload and too much work. I wanna thank all of you with us today for taking time out of your own very busy schedule in order to hear this presentation as it's likely that, that you have quite a lot on your own plate as well. 
another very common stressor is time pressure, where we are working against deadlines and need to complete a certain amount of work in a certain amount of time. And so if we already have too much work to do and then we add time pressure or deadlines on top of that, that can exacerbate stressors and the stress process. Another one is emotional labor where we have to display ourselves or engage in work with customers or with coworkers or other people in a work context in a way that might be different from how we're actually feeling. So for example, when I log on to teach a class, regardless of whatever chaos may be happening in the background with my own family and as a mom of two boys who are quite exuberant and love to interrupt me, um, I need to do my best to try and remain composed and, and not um, lose it when I'm, I'm in those situations. And work family conflict, which may be in part why you decided to join today. So work family conflict is when what happens in our work life can interfere with and lead to conflict and these roles um, get mixed up so that uh, work interferes with non-work and also non-work can interfere with work. According to Greenhouse and Butel, who were among the first researchers to contribute to the research literature on work family issues back in 1985, Greenhouse and Butel identified three sources of work family conflict. The first and very most common source of conflict between work and non-work is time. Simply the time that we're spending working is time that we are not able to do other things in our and likewise, time that we need to attend to and do things in our personal life, whether it's to meet family responsibilities or manage things in the house uh, or take care of an aging parent or another person, or just take a break from work and psychologically recover and enjoy a weekend or perhaps a day off, um, that's time that we're not spending working. So time is a source of conflict. Additionally, strain. So if we have a stressful day at work or experience something at work that puts us in a bad mood, um, that may carry over and affect us in terms of our non-work life or we just may not have enough energy. And finally, behavior-based conflict, which is not as common as time or strain-based conflict. Behavior-based conflict occurs when the way we are expected to act at work is different from how we're expected to, to behave outside of work. An example of this might be a police officer who needs to strongly enforce rules or be stern with perhaps the person who's speeding, but yet go home and be warm and loving with that person's family. So these stressors can and often do result in a number of important negative outcomes, including being less satisfied with our job, thinking about leaving where we're working and turning over. It, as Jeannie indicated, it can affect our physical health and in many, many ways, um, anything from gastrointestinal disorders to triggers for migraines and longer term health effects in terms of heart disease and other physical health issues. Another common outcome of the stress process is sleep, where we may have difficulty getting to sleep or difficulty where it's called uh, waking after sleep onset, in which we wake up in the middle of the night and have difficulty getting back to sleep and sleeping where we do not have sufficient quantity of sleep, not enough hours in terms of the recommended, the National Sleep Foundation recommends seven to nine hours of sleep per night but in addition to sufficient quantity of sleep, it's also important to focus on sleep quality and work-related stress can unfortunately have a negative impact on our sleep quality. And insufficient sleep in turn can have a negative effect on the next day's work in terms of our energy, our ability to concentrate, our productivity, our mood, and so forth. Um, very, very important outcome of stress, unfortunately, can also be a number of mental health issues with depression and anxiety being quite common. Again, uh, Jeannie spoke to many of these in her excellent introduction. And it's important to note that what happens at work and challenges with work family issues can affect our mental health as well. And then finally, and not the least important of which is burnout, characterized by exhaustion, fatigue, a sense of depersonalization where we're distanced from our work or um, the extent to which we um, 
we are just really struggling to get work done. Another way of thinking about the work stress process has to do with a balance between the demands or what is expected of us at work and the amount of resources that we have available. This is based on the job demands resources model, which is in the literature based on work by researchers like Eva Demarudi, Arnold Backer, and Shafeli, and so forth. And simply put, when what is expected of us at work and the demands that we are expected to complete exceed the resources, such as our time and energy, then that is likely to trigger the stress process. Work-family conflict, as I indicated, is another specific stressor. I've already defined that here, but again, it's recognizing that work can have a negative impact on non-work issues and also that our non-work demands and expectations impact work. I also want to mention there are benefits to juggling work and family. It's not all negative and there's a growing body of research that points to positive spillover and positive benefits of juggling work and non-work. But when we're speaking in the context of stress, we're focusing on the negative aspects and the conflict take place. Another common issue with the stress process is meaningful work. And the, having the opportunity and the privilege of working in jobs that we find personally meaningful and that provide a sense of purpose and a sense that we're doing well for the community or the, the greater good is very, very beneficial. But there's a, a new growing body of research that also highlights that being engaged in meaningful work can be a source of stress to the extent that we identify so strongly with our work that we may have difficulty pulling ourselves away, or we may spend so much time working that it can have a negative impact um, on the other aspects of our lives simply due to too much work. Uh, and finally, a time component. Again, just that time is a limited resource and time that we don't spend working um, or time that we spend working means time that we can't spend in the other way. During COVID, it's important to recognize that work family stress for many people, for many workers, is really at an all time high. First and foremost, I would imagine that many of you, although not all, but many of you who have joined in today may be working from home and working from home on many more days than you ever thought that you might given this ongoing pandemic that unfortunately we are experiencing. And um, working from home periodically, teleworking for many is a benefit, but when we don't have the opportunity or the choice for being able to go into our office and have quiet and, and a space away from all of the laundry piling up, the dishes that need to be done, the groceries, uh, not to mention whatever may be happening with kids or one's spouse or partner can add to the stress. I also want to acknowledge certainly not everybody is working from home and there are many people who are still going into their typical organization and place from work. But for those working from home, the effect that this has had is that it reduces the boundaries between what is our work life and what is our home life. And those boundaries are both physical boundaries as well as psychological boundaries. Physical boundaries in that we're simply bringing our work physically into the home. Recommendations here include having a separate space or a separate room in which to do that work. I often will close the door to my home office and sometimes even put a sign on the door asking my, my kids and my partner not to interrupt if I'm in a meeting or doing something like this where uh, somebody coming in and talking would certainly disrupt my concentration, if not the flow of my work. Um, the person in my, or I shouldn't say person, but the being in my home who does not read that sign very effectively is my dog, who will uh, typically barge in uh, when I least expect it. Um, and the process of juggling work and family responsibilities is really added when people are working from a home environment, when typically they're not used to it, or when it is on an ongoing basis. And for many workers, part of the issue during this pandemic is also having to manage children's education at home. Although there are some places where kids are back physically in school, in some of those places it is not full time, it is not five days a week. 
and uh, with the online education is more responsibility on parents to help make sure that students are doing what they need to do and have the support for their education and for working parents that's particularly difficult when also trying to manage their own work. If you are a parent in this situation, perhaps you can relate. And for those of you who aren't, I just encourage you to be aware that maybe your coworkers or people you supervise or others in your work environment may be struggling with this and may be struggling more than you are aware of, especially if they're engaged in emotional labor and trying to put on a happy face in spite of, of really struggling. During this stressful time, and also in with potentially more interruptions, it's possible that workers are having difficulty concentrating and suffering from reduced productivity. There may also be changes in work hours as individuals have to shift around spouse or partner schedules or shift around their children's activities and schoolwork um, and may not be able to work. So for anyone that might have typically worked, for example, from nine to five, it could be that they stop work in the middle of the afternoon or even need to take an hour off at lunchtime to be able to provide food for their family um, or manage other things that they maybe didn't have to do when they were simply away at work all day. So just being aware of these issues. The good news is that there are some evidence-based strategies that we can use to accomplish this. Based on a prevention model in public health, the most effective source of dealing with this and reducing stress is primary prevention, shown over here on the left side of your screen. Primary prevention consists of eliminating the stressor to begin with and hoping that it doesn't even come about. Although to the extent that we can't often eliminate stressors to begin with, hopefully we can intervene with buffers or um, tertiary prevention is we're treating the outcomes, such as going to the doctor, seeking mental health support, or whatever might happen even after we experience strain. With that prevention model in mind, specific things that we can do are to reduce demands by simply reducing workload, reducing time pressure, um, perhaps extending deadlines, or reducing the amount of work that we are expected to do in a particular amount of time or um, reducing taking things off people's plates uh, for those on your staff can be incredibly helpful. Sometimes it's not possible to reduce the demands, but then what we can do is try to increase resources. Two specific resources that have been widely established and supported in the occupational health psychology literature include giving workers autonomy, in other words, some say or control or opportunity to make decisions about either the nature of the work that they're doing, the way in which they go about doing their work, or um, some schedule flexibility or location flexibility. So just simply allowing people to flex their hours and have some say about when they work can really go a long way toward helping employees meet their needs for juggling work and family issues. Likewise, location flexibility. And during this pandemic, if anything, we may have less flexibility in where we work. It may not be possible to return to the office. It may not be considered safe, or people may be in jobs where they still need to report to work in spite of all of that. Um, and simply one thing that we recommend supervisors and workers do is have a conversation that even, for example, in my work environment, um, working in the office isn't completely off limits and there are certain guidelines that just need to be followed, but negotiating when it may be possible for an individual who's struggling with some work family issues to perhaps be able to return to the office may be of benefit or help. Or maybe it's allowing them to work from home because their kids are home from school and they have young children and they need that opportunity to be home because childcare may not be a safe option. There's a large amount of literature that has indicated supervisor and coworker support are incredibly useful for helping employees manage work and family issues. And Leslie Hammer and her colleagues in Portland have demonstrated quite a lot of this with evidence from family support of supervisor behaviors. And I will discuss these types of behaviors and what can be done uh, in just a short while. 
at the so now I'm going to just describe some strategies, evidence based recommendations at three different levels, including at the overall organizational level for supervisors and then what workers yourself or themselves may be able to do to address these issues and ameliorate the negative effects of stress. First and foremost, at the organizational level, it is important to have clear communication, especially with regard to whatever policies and procedures are in place, whether it is specific to COVID or in terms of managing work, non-work demands or whatever the case may be. There may be changing priorities. There may be other um, economic or macroeconomic factors at play, but simply by communicating clearly can be very helpful. Likewise, um, strong and effective leadership to provide clear direction and reduce ambiguity to workers. Providing supervisor training and especially training with regard to family supportive supervisor behaviors has been shown to be effective. And then effective talent management, which includes staffing the people who are most qualified for the job, providing them with the resources they need to finish their job and establishing a good fit between individuals and the environment is helpful. And Finally, just attending to good job design characteristics by giving people autonomy and some say, providing feedback, giving them meaningful work and so forth. So with regard to family support of supervisor behaviors, Hammer and colleagues have identified four specific types of behaviors that are helpful. The first is instrumental support. So for example, if a worker is having some challenges with meeting their work schedule, providing clear, instrumental support in managing that schedule, perhaps all developing a separate schedule or identifying what specifically can be done to address the issue and provide clear support. The second is emotional support by simply empathizing with workers. I'm not suggesting that supervisors go so far as counsel, but just provide emotional support. Third is role modeling and recognizing that as a supervisor, that they are a model for how to manage work and non-work responsibilities and whether supervisors are aware of them or not. Their behavior, such as what time they send emails and how they manage their work is something that is evident to others. And so part of this is being a positive role model for how to manage work and non-work. And finally, working creatively with people in a work group or work team to develop solutions to address work family needs. Psychological safety is important simply so that workers and supervisors may have frank, open conversations and communications in a way that they feel comfortable sharing their views and their experiences to address these issues. So in other words, establishing a culture of trust where people feel psychologically safe to share what they're dealing with. Um, so just uh, I'll, in the interest of time, move past this, but just tips for supervisors are to follow up on what I just said. And finally, in terms of individuals, there are a few things. First of all is self-care and recognize that it's not selfish to want to get sufficient exercise, good nutrition, and make sure that you are getting at least seven to nine hours of good quality sleep. Secondly, to establish and negotiate with your work uh, with your work colleagues and workers as well as with family on ways to set effective boundaries between work and non-work boundaries whether that's work hours or boundaries in terms of physical works job crafting is a strategy established in the literature where people may focus on strengths of their work and maybe may have the luxury of being able to focus on what they're good at and what they like to do most so that they can pursue work in which they'll be most engaged and most motivated. And finally, focusing on the positive aspects of your job in terms of meaning and embracing and remembering the, the good things about your work and why you're doing what you're doing. So I'll conclude by just saying that by following these evidence-based strategies, there is hope. Um, and uh, if you have questions, as was indicated, you can go ahead and put those in the chat and hopefully we'll have time for discussion. And here is my contact information if anyone would like to reach out to me directly. I'm now happy to turn it over to Corey. And Corey, I hope I haven't taken up too much of your time for your presentation. Thank you all so much. Great. Thank you, Gwen. I'm going to get the screen share here started on my side. Um, that was wonderful information. I think one of the nice things 
that we're going to see is that uh, you know there's there's actually uh, I think going to be quite a bit of parity between what we saw and uh, and in Gwen's presentation and in mine. Okay, great. Sorry about that. Uh, I'm not sure quite why that happened, but um, uh, and like I mentioned, you're, you're going to see a lot of parity here between the content that was just shared and what we've got, just through you know somewhat of, of a different lens from the practitioner's point of view in the world of HR. Uh, and so we're going to really break this down into uh, a state of what we're currently seeing as far as workplace wellness. We're going to talk through providing support at different levels. Um, I think maybe going a little bit in the reverse order of what we just covered, starting with the individual, going out to the colleague, talking about other supporters within sort of each person on your team's um, environment, uh, and then more broadly, the organization. And we'll wrap up with takeaways, and our team that's put this content together has provided resources as well. So in the materials that come out, you'll be able to see um, sort of the different places where these uh, comments were pulled from. So when we look at the state of current workplace wellness, this seems like a great place to start building a foundation of what we're seeing. Uh, a lot of the data that we're going to talk through is either cited or it actually came from our customers in some cases whenever we, we were working to gather information about what's going on in sort of the working world today. So employee wellness in 2020 is definitely a big topic, and I think it's at the forefront of all of our minds. In the research that we've been reviewing, 69% of workers say that the COVID-19 pandemic is the most stressful time of their entire professional career. And I think that regardless of what your role is in industry, regardless of what you see going on um, in your own personal world, uh, the degree to which this impacts you is definitely noticeable, and, and it's easy to see it impacting others around you. Um, over half of employees say that they're burnt out, um, and, and even um, the World Health Organization uh, classifies burnout as an occupational phenomenon. We're finding also uh, that 59% of workers are taking less time off than they normally would, and we see the factors that influence that in sort of our, our daily observations in the workforce. Uh, folks feel like, you know, there's really no place for them to go, so why would they, you know, quote, unquote, burn a vacation day? Um, and, and I can't tell you how not true I feel like that is. Uh, you know, taking that time away, taking time for yourself, no matter what is going on, is, is critical. And as leaders within organizations and as HR professionals, it's important that we continue to reinforce that value to our teams. 55% of HR professionals say that they have not seen an increase in burnout uh, as a result of COVID-19, despite what workers are reporting. And we highlight this fact because it clearly illustrates a disconnect uh, between the critical need for employers to better understand the challenges that employees are facing um, and sort of the mechanism with which that feedback is passed through. There are so many different factors that are stressing our workforce as a, in totality today, um, and, and it's important to understand that um, it's more than what, you know, sort of you see on the surface. You might have somebody who's on your team that's very happy and friendly and jovial, and they're, they're just, you know, an all-around great person to be around, and they're uplifting, but they could still be struggling, um, and it's important to, you know, make sure that we're taking into account the sort of perspectives and, and, and feelings of all people as we're trying to navigate, you know, sort of getting to an ultimate source of truth with how our team is, is doing in light of what's going on. And there are a number of pandemic stressors that we're seeing play a role. Um, you know, we're seeing our workforce more so now than ever report challenges of coping with changes, um, challenges around conflicts and conflict management. Uh, and even dealing with the unexpected. You know, there are so many businesses in the world today that don't know what's next for them, that don't know what's coming down the pike, and it can be scary regardless of what level of position you hold within your organization. Uh, so it's important to, I think, be sensitive and have the appropriate amount of empathy to that. Employees are facing these unprecedented challenges, and it's coming at all of us from all directions. Certainly at work, you run into issues with managing different workloads or tasks or even the mechanisms through which you work now being, um, in a lot of cases, remote. Uh, you know, understanding that fear of exposure to, um, to, to COVID-19, um, taking care of family needs while working, job security, but then beyond what you feel as a stressor at work, you've got all of these things in your personal life, health concerns, financial instability, um, and, and child care needs. And there's, there's a lot that goes on that can be weighing heavy on the shoulders of our workforce today. 
So we want to talk a little bit about supporting the individual. And, and I think that this is an important place to start. And, and as we go through the content here, um, I encourage people to look at this through two lenses. As a, as a business leader, as an HR professional, as, as a, a, a team leader, um, regardless of where you fall in the organization, certainly look at this in, in sort of how you and, and the business are supporting the people that work for the company. Um, but beyond that, also think about how you are getting access to support for yourself and how you're handling that. We'll talk a little bit more uh, it, with some, you know, intent around supporting managers. Um, but, you know, the whole way through the presentation today, I think it's important to not overlook yourself and, and the importance of your own sort of um, mental health and, and outlook while we're navigating these unprecedented times. So putting people first is a very logical place to start in our mind. You know, organizational success really does start with overall well-being. We've talked a lot about mental health, but we're also going to mention a few things about physical health throughout the course of the conversation today. Above all, we find that employees really want to feel heard, and especially in this uncertain time, in a time of crisis, um, it's really important to know that the messages are coming through, uh, and, and that's kind of uh, even more challenging because we know that a lot of people are working remotely as it stands. Um, and, and think about how you recognize a person's needs in, in this sort of working environment. Even if your entire workforce has gone back and is working in the same physical location, uh, addressing needs and, and being able to create those quality interactions certainly has a different tone and tenor than it has in the past. So making sure that you are acknowledging your approach to recognizing needs of others um, and adapting to the constraints of today's world is, is a really important thing to consider. Uh, an, an astonishing statistic that we found as we were surveying folks and, and doing research for this today, only 64% of teams actively monitor employee well-being. And we're talking about this through the context of holistic well-being, not necessarily just professional engagement, how well are you doing at work, but we, I mean, we're talking about the full sort of overarching concept of well-being as a human being. So whenever we're thinking about supporting the individual, we also think it's, it's pretty natural to talk about ways that you might consider monitoring employee well-being. Um, first, you know, assess what's going on. It, it, you know, find the right approach to gathering the feedback or surveying the, the workforce that you've got to understand their sentiment, their emotion around this. Uh, think about what are important objectives for you. And, you know, there's a lot of sensitive information. None of us are practitioners, or most of us aren't practitioners. And so uh, whenever we're thinking about this, too, think about objectives in the context of providing resources and, and creating safe avenues to channel information and, and providing, you know, the right coaching and counseling resources when they're needed to your team. Uh, think beyond that about how you would design a program map out, you know, what are you trying to achieve? Where do you want to feel impact? What does that impact look like? Um, and then map out how you'll collect feedback from the team. One of the best sources in figuring out where to go to support your team is asking them what they need. It's simple and, and a lot of times overlooked. Think about what tools you've got around you. Think about what tools you might have from a technical perspective to help you create meaningful interactions with your team. Um, you know, we make a reference here to a tool called 15.5. Um, it's something that we use internally to manage the weekly one-on-one -on -one conversation that our team members have with their leaders. And it's a great tool in helping to foster that sort of closer connection despite the remote nature of a lot of businesses today. And that lends itself very nicely to engaging your workforce. Understand how your workforce feels about engagement at work. Understand where their minds are in this and, and understand where there's opportunities to improve. Um, if everybody on your workforce has gone back to a brick and mortar location, certainly, you know, engagement is still different for you even though you're under the same roof. And, and certainly if you've got an entirely remote workforce, that engagement still continues to be a challenge. Fostering transparency is important. We talked a lot on this slide alone, honestly, about catching, capturing that feedback and, and understanding the perspective of your team. Um, but if you can't create this sort of safe space, this transparency within the team, um, it, it gets really difficult to collect actionable feedback. It gets really difficult to get a true sense 
of what's going on within the business. So sharing goals and, and letting employees know that you care is a great first step. There's no such thing as too much empathy. Um, and so don't be afraid to even, you know, to a degree show some vulnerability with your team and, and you know, share some of your challenges in light of what's going on and how you've overcome them if you feel appropriate to do so. Um, and then tracking progress as with any sort of program like this, uh, tracking that progress is really important. Make sure that you understand sort of what objectives are you trying to launch, how are they performing, are you going to be able to hit your deadlines, do you think that you're getting the intended impact here that you originally started out to try and achieve, and, and keeping those in mind I think certainly can help change the script for your team internally. The unique challenges of working parents also can't be overlooked. We know that there's a lot of folks, and, and we talked about this a little bit earlier even in the call today, a lot of folks working at home with children who are schooling at home. They might have a lack of child care. They might be dealing with distance learning. Um, there are certainly new routines going on um, and, and, you know, a heavier workload. They're, they're focusing on, you know, educating their children or being a, a deeper part of their children's education, and it takes you know, it takes effort, it takes energy to do these things. Um, and creating some sort of resource or toolkit for working parents that are on your team is a nice thing to consider as you're evolving your program and understanding what you've got in place here. So a common question when we talk about that is how can HR really help? And it, it starts with providing resources. 66% of HR teams currently do not provide any specific resources for working parents. And this is not honestly a big lift. It could be something like coloring sheets or some sort of educational resource or some way of, of providing activities and guidance and, and help to working parents that are, are maybe challenged with juggling different priorities at home now, things that they haven't had to deal with ever before. Uh, and, and, you know, it's okay to get creative. If you've got, you say, an entirely remote workforce, maybe it is sending coloring kits, maybe it's having some sort of virtual event at the end of a day where kids are invited to come in and, and, and you know, be a part of the conversation. Um, and one of the ideas that I like that came out of some of the conversations we've had internally is, is recording a remote story time. If you know there's a lot of, uh, a lot of children that are, um, you know, around at home for your workforce, you know, why not consider such a thing? Why not consider, you know, how, how many kids would – would attend such a thing uh, and have somebody on the on the team, you know, prepare that that material, that content. Um, and then remote assistance is certainly one of the most critical challenges that I think a lot of businesses face. I know that if you know tech companies great at working remotely in most cases, but you know there's always adaptation. There's always change curve that we have to manage as we make that type of transition. So think about the tools and equipment that your team uses. How do you communicate? How do you make sure that people have a working space at home? And can you help them with getting it set up? Um, and how well equipped is your IT team to support folks who are working remotely from home? All of these challenges are things to consider, and there are tools out there that can help you do this that make sort of everybody in the equation's life a lot easier. One of the final things we'll touch on in this section is culture and engagement. And, you know, I, I personally believe firmly in, in the value of one-on-ones and routine one-on-ones between team leads um, and, and those who report into them. Uh, we're big believers of doing them weekly at Jazz HR, and there is so much benefit to having an open dialogue on a routine basis. And I know that not all organizations are structured in a way that allows you to do this, but if you can, if you can find a way, I, I really recommend that you do. Um, if your team is struggling to create consistency or, or with expectations, maybe a remote work policy is appropriate, but ultimately at the end of the day, over-communicating expectations is, is really, really key. Making sure that there's transparency and alignment across the dimensions of your business is, is crucial to ushering it forward. In the next section, we'll talk about supporting the colleague. And, and so, you know, we think about the role that, that HR plays and, and how we interact with teams um, and, and how managers and supervisors interact with their teams and maybe even other teams. And, and there's just a lot of opportunity here to harness the power of a team, even while in this remote setting um, or while facing, uh, you know, a, a pandemic. And it, it starts with adaptation. You know, we've got to adjust the way that we are interacting with our workforce. We've got to better understand sort of the emotions and the motives behind the actions that are going on on the daily. 
Uh, and so, you know, think about how effective support becomes a crucial part to leadership. Understanding teams' perspectives, understanding the differences in teams' perspectives is also an important step here. And recognize where help is needed. Um, if you're managing a remote workforce today and you aren't typically remote, you know, I'd be willing to bet that there are managers on your team that this is their first sort of entrance to remote work. And not knowing what to do or, or how to support workers remotely can be a challenge if it's something you've not done before. So think about how the business can support folks who are leading others going through this transition and create that safe space where you can have a professional conversation uh, and, and those who need help are, are comfortable and empowered to reach out and say, I'm, I'm not sure what I'm doing. I'm not sure how to overcome this challenge in a remote world, and, and can you please help me? You know, create that open door, virtual open door, if you will, in that case. Um, and, and think about how you can create an engaging environment um, despite the challenges of not everybody being together. If your business has gone through a transition of, of on-site work to remote work, uh, you know, the game has changed for creating an engagement program. It's definitely challenging and something that needs to be done exceptionally thoughtfully. So your team's perspective is where we, you know, started on the last slide, and, and there's, there's a lot to unpack here. Think about how communication gets passed throughout your organization. What's your communication loop look like? How does that need to be modified or optimized based on what's going on in the world and how your business is responding to what's going on? Think about how you can collect feedback. Um, and I think one of the biggest things that's critical, especially if you've gone from an entirely on-site workforce to an entirely remote or hybrid workforce, is embracing that non-work discussion. You know, we spend a lot of time in meetings, especially in today's world, and, and with all of them being virtual for some folks out there, you know, you feel like you spend from the moment you start working to the moment you quit working in a day. Um, you know, connected and on camera and, you know, having to perform, having to deliver. And, and you, you miss out on those true connection moments where you can connect with the person instead of the colleague. Understanding and creating that true personal bond is important. And though it's challenging when, when being done virtually, you can achieve this within your business. And, and it can create a lot of value. Um, and then the, the point on celebrating differences and welcoming varying opinions. You know, collaboration definitely can be done regardless of sort of the work setup that you've got in place today. Um, but there are some challenges. You know, figuring out how to uh, drive innovation and, and boost productivity and, and be focused on overcoming obstacles and challenges. Uh, you know, there certainly are a lot, of, a lot of competing priorities that come into play in that arena. Um, and thinking about how you sort of usher the team through it and empower them with tools and resources to navigate is, uh, is really crucial during this time. So as you're collecting perspective, I think it goes without saying that recognizing when help is needed is, a, is an important characteristic or important skill, rather, to have um, and, and one that, that maybe isn't, uh, isn't that easy for a lot of people on your team. You know, look for signs of increased conflict. Look for lacking communication. Look for repetitive patterns. Look, look for whenever problems come up and, it, and the same problem is coming up with small twists or variations over and over again. Um, be on the lookout for that reduced engagement or, or even, you know, watch out for turnover. Even in spite of a global pandemic, you look at the statistics out there and there's some interesting trends that go on with turnover depending on the type of business you're a part of and the industry that you're in, I mean, there's, there's some telling things out there. So all of these things are, are really important to keep in mind and consider. And when we talk about that safe professional space, you know, we talk about honesty, and I think there's, you know, a, a considerable amount of buzz around the word candor or, or candidness. Um, and I think it all kind of boils up to, to honesty, you know, creating this honest feedback sort of area where folks even anonymously can provide um, questions that certain people are able to answer or, um, you know, in a group setting respond to or, or, or reply to. Um, and, and think about the respect that your team shows during video calls or, or even, you know, in-person meetings or if you're hybrid, you know, the remote folks versus the in-person folks. Think about, you know, speaking without interruption. 
um, and, and not being afraid to, when the time comes, say, hey, this is like an individual problem. Let's take it offline, and, and let's, let's have a one-on-one -on -one conversation to resolve this. Um, you know, sometimes that can be your best friend or your worst enemy. I, I totally understand that, but there is a time and a place and a proper application for sort of keeping the conversation at hand on track um, and having those breakout conversations when needed. When it comes to thinking about the future and, and building your team up, think about that ongoing training. Think about how people can continue to grow and develop within your business and think about the consistency that you create as things change within the company. Celebrate those wins and do it together. Do it loudly. You know, do it with some fanfare and, and talk about where your business is achieving great results. Make sure everybody knows. And when there's missteps or things don't go quite your way or you run into a challenge, talk about it. Share that, that feedback that you've gotten. Share what, what we think the challenge was. Try to troubleshoot and diagnose and figure out how you, know, you can create a better path forward next time. Think about maybe who can come into your business as a guest speaker or a subject matter expert that can help you make sure that things stay on track. Um, and above all, continue to prioritize that internal wellness. We also found it interesting that about 37% of teams are hosting weekly activities to boost engagement. You know, this is, uh, this is something that I think, from my perspective, um, is, is a challenge to prepare for and is rewarding whenever you know that the team has enjoyed it. Think about how you can conduct a team event that's not, not a meeting, not a discussion about an initiative within the business, but like an, an actual event like you may have hosted whenever you were working in person or whenever you could have people in, in close proximity to one another. Um, think about how you can still create those opportunities to allow those connections to form um, and to be reinforced or rebuilt in some cases as we struggled with sort of the transition of work over the past several months. That engaging environment can do so much for you. Uh, virtual coffee breaks, happy hours, team competitions, uh, even I know some organizations doing meditation or wellness breaks as a group virtually uh, to, you know, give people that opportunity to engage in a non-work related activity with others that they work with to try and create those more human elements to the day-to-day -day interaction. And we spoke of this previously, sharing those wins and, and recognition. You know, think about the, the pride that comes whenever a manager shares recognition for a team member. You know, we see engagement as much as 60% whenever that happens. And acknowledge achievements, big and small, regularly and I'll add here, quickly. You know, something going well in July that doesn't get recognition until the end of September or the beginning of October doesn't have the same impact of, you know, compounding that, that pride that comes from achieving a project or, or a goal, completing a, a big assignment, um, and then getting recognized for it all at the same time. There's a lot of value add, a lot of goodwill to your team if, if you're able to do that and adopt that methodology. We'll transition now into the third part, which is supporting those who support the individual. And this, folks, is all about your managers. We're going to talk about a few different areas here, um, but think about how you empower as a business, how you empower managers with resources, best practices, and ideas for overcoming uncertainty. Uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of skepticism in the world today around the future of small businesses. Uh, and as we've talked about, and as you all see, if you read the headlines, there's a lot of small businesses that are challenged right now. Think about what those resources look like for your managers. And as you get more exposure to these types of events, as you get more opportunity to sort of creatively think and, and prepare to, to better support your managers, Lead by example. If you're taking on the task of creating um, content or, or getting resources put together to, to support managers in your business, then by virtue of the fact that you're doing that, you've got an opportunity to lead that charge. And when you're leading that, think about how you're showing your adoption of those best practices. Um, and think about personalization. I, I know that that makes this a little bit more complex. Nothing you know, makes, I think, anybody happier than a nice scalable program that can be rolled out across the entire business um, at once. But you've really got to understand the competing challenges and priorities of different teams within your business to make sure that what you're delivering is meaningful and impactful to the folks you're delivering it to. So in this context, 
where do your managers in your business struggle? Because that's going to be different than where the managers that are at Jazz HR struggle or the managers at the company down the street struggle. Understand where those challenge points are um, and then personalize what's right for them and use that personalization approach to also make sure that you've got a variety of activities and a variety of opportunity to create this engagement, not only with managers, but with your, with your team members. You know, we say it here best, happy hours aren't for everybody. So how can we engage the rest of the workforce in a meaningful way? Um, you know, that's a challenge that each business has to address on their own. So next up is the challenge of remote onboarding. And this is an interesting one um, if you're onboarding folks remotely now and you haven't necessarily done it before, uh, it's, it's interesting to navigate those waters because you've got to be proactively preparing for those folks to join. Um, you know, communication is key from the second a candidate signs the offer letter to the day that they virtually join your team. Figure out how you're going to engage those candidates. Figure out how you're going to welcome them and think about what that communication plan looks like. Who's reaching out? When are they reaching out? What are they reaching out for? Think about welcome packages. It could be, you know, their equipment to be able to do their job remotely. It can be swag. It, it can be anything that's coming from your business to the folks that are joining you. Send a message. It's an opportunity for you to create an impression of, of the welcoming environment that those folks are going to be joining. And, and it's, it's really critical. Um, think about a remote buddy, somebody who's like that first point of contact. I think of it as like the ambassador for that person who's going to help like usher them through their day and, and help them know who they need to reach out to when and, and for what reasons. Um, and think about, you know, how your training can be adapted to accommodate the remote worker. Training managers on burnout is key. And, and you know, I think that it's, it's much more here about uh, making sure that they've got resources to provide their team as well. I think that this is a really personal decision and a personal topic, you know, whether somebody is, is burnt out or not. And we don't want our managers to take on the role of like a junior psychologist. That's not, a, that's not appropriate or their place to fill. Um, but teaching them, you know, how to support folks and how to provide those resources in a professional and empathetic way is, is really key. Think about how your managers are um, aware of causes and, and symptoms and, and risk factors uh, to help prevent that burnout before it starts. And, and keep this stat in mind. This was kind of shocking at the bottom. 55% of employers do not currently teach their managers about signs of burnout. And if you remember to one of the things that I said at the beginning of this section, um, don't overlook yourself, right? If, if your managers can't spot it, if there aren't resources within the business, do you know how to spot it? And, and do you know when you're getting burnt out? And do you know whenever you, you need to say, hey, it's time for a break and I need to figure out what that, what that release is, what that opportunity is to catch my breath and, and take advantage of it. So mental health has some stigma around it in today's world. And, and I hope that as we continue to march forward as a society, we, we continue to see um, open conversation and dialogues about this. And it's important for our leadership teams to talk about well-being and do so often. Share facts, get resources put together, promote that self-care, ensure confidentiality. Remember, it's, it's a trusted, safe space. It's, it's a place where you can be open and honest without any sort of inhibition um, and confidentiality and, and being able to ensure it goes a long way. And think beyond to mental health and, and consider physical health as well. That physical wellness becomes key. You know, one of the things that I think I've, I've personally been um, trying to navigate and struggling with is I, I walk around a lot whenever we're in person and, and at the office, and that's not something that I can do. You know, I'm, I'm at home in a home office, and there's nobody else working in the house while I'm working, so, you know, I can't go have a conversation face-to-face, -face. and I, I miss the, the, the kind of joy that I get from working with our team in person while we're going through this time. I'm quickly going to go through the final section here, which is supporting the organization. Um, we'll be quick and brief here. Uh, adapting to that new workplace is key. We've talked about the ways that these have changed, uh, that, that the workplace rather has changed. But think about how organizations have to accelerate transformation in so many different ways, protecting your employees, digitizing those processes that go on, staying connected, and tracking progress. How do people know how the business is performing? How do your people know? how they are performing, and, and think beyond just reacting to COVID. 
you know, there's opportunity here for you to optimize your business regardless of what your future work environment holds. Um, and so, you know, think about now, but also think about to the best of your ability how you future proof there. And your program's got to be unique to you and to your business. It's got to be customizable, it's got to be scalable, and you've got to find the right ways to have an impact in your business for your team. It's not going to be the same as your network's plan. It's not going to your network connections plan. It's not going to be the same as you know what your benefit broker sends you as as a sample program or policy. You've got to really be in tune to your particular workforce and understand where at all levels there's opportunity for impact and improvement. And think about how you track well-being within the workforce. What are your current efforts? Analyze those trends and think about how you can create that continuous improvement cycle. It's, it, it is more than just metrics. It's about how you provide support, but certainly, you know, it's, it's easy to see trends and, and, and analysis as, as a key component to determining the success of your program. So in closing, there are some key takeaways here and, you know, think about above all else the individual. Think about how happy people create those happy organizations, and think about how that 2020 impact of stress has, has had a toll on your workforce and what you're doing to help correct it or help support the team. Monitor what's going on in your business. Have open dialogue conversations with those around you, and really try and get to the, the heart of what each person's issue is or what the challenges may be, what those trends and challenges may be, and empower your leaders to stay connected. You know, your leaders within a business are, are definitely, uh, especially now due to the virtual nature, in a lot of cases finding themselves on the front line of an area that they have never envisioned before. And so navigating that as a leader, even if you're seasoned and experienced, can be challenging and intimidating. Think about the support that you provide there for those folks and don't be afraid to get creative. We are all trying to solve a new set of challenges here as leaders within businesses. And you know, at the end of the day, nobody's gonna have the exact right perfect answer, um, but we've gotta keep trying. We've gotta, you know, we've gotta have that optimistic outlook that through these programs and through a better understanding of our workforce and their holistic wellness, um, you know, we, we've gotta look forward to seeing the impact and the, the positivity that comes from taking action in your business through this lens. Thank you all so much for the opportunity to join me today. That was the final slide that I have for you. Excellent. Uh, thank you both, uh, Gwen and Corey. And I'm going to uh, move us into our question and answer portion of our um, webinar today. Thank you very much again for uh, very informative and enlightening pre presentations. Um, and I want to encourage everyone in the audience, if you have a question, please type it in in the Q&A box and we'll um, try to get to all of your comments and questions. Um, first, we had a comment, and um, I know that Gwen had a chance to see it and, re and uh, respond, but uh, someone noted that they wanted to add to the list of work family stress during the COVID experience, um, managing additional meals due to children being uh, something they were not prepared for, uh, grocery purchases, planning, uh, preparing and cleaning up after meals and all the additional time. And I can say with young children at home, I second that. It's, you know, and as Corey and Gwen both noted, we're dealing with um, things coming at us from multiple directions here. So um, we certainly have to be creative in our approaches to supporting workers. Um, we had a question. Uh, if the employee is essential and cannot work remotely, what other options can we provide them with? And I, I think you both might have um, thoughts on this. So um, Gwen, do you want to start with that question? Sure, yes. First, I just want to say I'm really glad this question was asked because we can't assume that everybody is working from home and there are people who are essential and do not necessarily have the flexibility to work from home. Um, one is if they're, depending on the nature of the job, if there's any flexibility in scheduling of work hours, but I know for many essential employees, part of what makes them essential is, is that that's not a possibility, but that depending on the situation is one. Um, one thing Corey mentioned that really resonated with me is just having those conversations, having one-on-one -on -one 
discussions between supervisors and employees or, or leaders asking people on the team just to really ask what do people need and how can they be supported? And it's difficult to give a one size fits all answer to this question because I think it really depends on the specific work environment and the specific employee and what their situation might be. But um, just having that conversation and, and opening that up so that those needs can be identified and then addressed based on within the constraints that they may be faced. I, I hope that helps. That's great. Thank you, Gwen. Uh, Corey, did you have anything you'd like to add? To yeah, you know, I, I, I agree with everything there. You know, I think at the end of the day, if you've got essential people working, um, you know, I, I think it is very much about focusing on adaptability as well. You know, you, you've got to think through um, different accommodations, different routines, different sort of um, approaches to their work day. Uh, it is really important to consider. Um, you know, even if you've got essential workers who are maybe um, uh, hourly, for instance, you know, maybe the way that you schedule shifts needs to be a little bit different to better support them. Um, you know, make sure that they, uh, above all else, you know, give them the things that they need to stay safe while they're in the workplace. Uh, you know, essential employees are, are in a dangerous situation, regardless of what they're doing, if they're essential and, and being put in a position where they've got to be around other people, um, you know, making sure that they've got adequate resources to protect themselves, I think, also goes without saying and, and is, is paramount. So I'd say that, you know, make sure they, they've got enough things around them, enough resources to truly feel safe. Um, and consider what types of adaptations from the normal you might need to make to in order in order to ensure their success. Excellent. Thank you both. Um, Corey, there was a question for you to uh, clarify. What is the 15-5 you mentioned? Oh, yeah. Uh, so that's actually, so it's a software. Um, it, it's, it's all web-based. It's a web-based app. Um, and basically, it's used in our business. Um, to manage uh, and track engagement. Uh, it also is where our weekly one-on-one -on -one conversations are held, so every person at Jazz HR should be meeting with their leader once a week. Um, so they're tracking that conversation, um, agenda items, action items, and notes uh, in there. It, it helps with accountability a lot. You know, everybody knows what everybody else is responsible for in that relationship. Um, and then we also use it for uh, OKR tracking or objectives and key results. So um, it, it's a tool that does help with alignment. Um, it, it's, it's pretty versatile, and, it, and it's worth a, a check out uh, if, if anybody's interested or trying to find a way to sort of empower that remote work world around them. Excellent. Thank you. Um, psychological safety. We had a question about what exactly psychological safety looks like in the workplace. Um, when? I'm happy to chime on in on this, Jeannie, because it was something that I had talked about, and I apologize that I didn't spend a lot of time on it, and, and it, I understand it, it wasn't clear. So psychological safety is when people in the workplace feel that they're, they're not going to, there isn't going to be retribution or backlash or criticism for speaking up and communicating their needs especially if it is something that might, if they're disclosing, if a worker's disclosing what their certain situation is. So for example, mentioning if they have a child with special needs that needs extra support while they're at home working or whatever the case might be, just creating a culture of trust and where employees can speak with their supervisors or coworkers to communicate their needs in a way that they won't be punished and they don't feel like it will come back at them. When people are able to communicate their needs and then feel supported will further help establish and build and support that culture of trust, which in turn can overall help the work environment. Right, thank you very much. Um, so here's a question for either or both of you around um, what is meant by communicate clearly. So you both emphasize the importance of communicating clearly to workers. Uh, do either of you have stories or case studies that you can refer to um, regarding how to communicate clearly and strategies for this? Take 
uh, the first crack at this and then turn it over to Corey. Um, one that comes to mind for me is for leaders and leaders and organizations to be very clear about what the priorities are and if priorities are shifting. So for example, right when COVID first began and a lot of work organizations needed to close their doors to the public and shift to a remote work environment, there was a lot of uncertainty and it was really important and organizations that seemed to weather that transition more effectively were the ones when leaders were in contact with people in the organization to indicate what the priorities were. And in the case, um, it led to, as you know, many layoffs and a lot of job insecurity for workers. And so just communicating directly about what all those issues are. And as um, so in some cases, there have been places where restraints and restrictions regarding COVID have um, been made less strict and people have returned to work. And so communicating effectively about what that return to work looks like or how policies may be changing. And in other places, unfortunately, like here in Colorado, we're seeing um, a, a really bad surge of the virus and therefore places that have been open may be um, closing their doors once again. And so just to the extent that priorities and regulations and policies are shifting, making sure that workers are aware of Corey, is there anything else you can add to help clarify this? Yeah, so I, I agree with everything that you said there. Um, I think I'd actually encourage folks to also, you know, take one step back from your overall communication strategy within your business and think about how um, if you are virtual now, um, you might be missing some of the benefit of in-person communication, like you can't read body language in all cases if you're not on a camera, and even then sometimes kind of hard. Um, you don't get to have like the afterthought conversations as often or as frequently, or at least I feel that way. Um, so, you know, making sure that there's really, you know, a sense of clear communication, but also over communication, I think is really important. I mean, even if you think about it, you know, if you are back in person or you're an essential uh, an essential worker who's reporting to a workplace each day, you've got a mask on, and even then you're missing out on some communication cues, those nonverbal communication cues, because you end up, you know, with a mask on. You walk past somebody in the hallway and you smile, they don't know, you know. So think about how, um, you know, it's really important to not lose sight of, you know, how communication barriers could be negatively impacting the work experience for your team and figure out how you create alignment across the board on, on improving that. So, um, I mean, that's, that's a lot of what I've been spending time thinking through as we talk about communication internally. Um, and it's, it's challenging, but uh, it's helpful. The more you talk about it and the more you create those sort of expectations around it. Thank you both. I think that that uh, concept of communicating clearly and opening the doors and allowing an, um, for an environment of trust is critical. Um, we had a question here about um, how we can encourage leaders specifically to help with preventing burnout in their team members when they themselves may be experiencing it. So I know, Corey, you talked to, uh, a good de deal about um, supporting the supporters and how to support managers. What are your thoughts about this? Yeah, so great question. And I think that, you know, th there's a lot of different routes to take this. Uh, I, I think that ultimately before you start to determine what this means for your business, you've got to understand how your managers currently operate and what their work style is. Um, I think it can be in some businesses as simple as having an open conversation with your group of leaders or one-on-one -on -one with leaders to talk about, you know, how do you perceive this and what does it look like to you um, versus here are some resources or, or maybe following up in those conversations with resources on, you know, tried and true proven ways of, of recognizing and coping. Um, and I also think as a part of that conversation, you've really got to reinforce the value of your team leaders, your, your leadership within your business. Um, showing that self-care, taking time off from work, unplugging, um, you know, is, is valuable and, and appropriate. You know, lead by example with that regard at all levels within the organization. Um, but I think really it comes down to customizing based on the type of 
managers that you've got and their sort of experience and aptitude um, because I think that it looks different for different organizations. And honestly, you know, thinking about our own organization, I think it probably looks different from team to team internally. And that's, that's not a bad thing at all. You know, each, each group is going to show it in their own way, but we've got to adapt and adjust um, to, to be able to recognize and support when necessary. So, um, you know, I think of resources that we've got that can help managers better understand this, like resources available through our employee assistance program, um, resources available from even our, our um, like our, our medical health insurance company has provided some resources and guidance to managing people um, with, uh, you know, in light of a pandemic. So, um, you know, I really think that that's a custom response. You, you've got you've to understand sort of the dynamic and, and mindset of your workforce to be able to come up with exactly what's going to work for your company. Thank you. There are a lot of great ideas, and I think the point about, you know, looking at the specific workplace and the specific needs of workers, not everyone um, is handling the pandemic. Not everyone handles challenges similarly, as Gwen talked about earlier, too. Um, we had another question. Do you see opportunities for employers to enhance understanding about automatic emotions and behaviors and ways to better regulate emotions during this time. Um, and you've both spoken to this in you know, varying ways during your talks today. Um, but the question is, do you have examples of workplaces that are doing this well? So are you familiar with any, um, either in your own personal experience, uh, in interaction with um, employers or workplaces, are either of you familiar with any company that's doing a really good job about kind of helping everyone regulate their emotions and, and deal with um, these challenges, or are there um, resources or something that's written up that we can point our audience to? Um, I can, so I've been consulting with a company in Boulder County, Colorado, that where they're very interested and concerned about these issues. And one of the issues that came up in one of those meetings was that um, at a time that people are dealing with extremely high levels of stress and perhaps, and as Corey indicated, uh, perhaps the most stressful time of people's careers, I think it's being, um, one issue that came up in the Boulder County was figuring out and identifying that different people respond differently. And if anything, being much more understanding, patient, and supportive, if the emotional reaction you get from people is different from what you would typically experience. So for example, if a supervisor is meeting with their employee and their employee just breaks down in tears and just recognize that people may be at their limit and that it's, it's a time of being as understanding and as forgiving as possible, um, it, not, it comes across for other people as being more irritable or grouchy or grumpy. And so um, on, I don't, and there's research in psychology that suggests one of the strategies for handling emotional labor is to create a culture of authenticity where it's more acceptable for people to be themselves rather to rather than reinforce norms where people need to really stifle and stuff those emotions inside. And of course, I mean, I'm not suggesting that people don't act professionally, but just be as understanding and as supportive as possible and recognize that people may be dealing with a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's, I, I think that's my suggestion. I hope that helps. That's great. Corey, did you have anything that you want to add? Yeah, so I, I think that um, I, I think that there's really a lot of different ways to take an approach here. And, and I think what stands out to me most is, you know, much like Gwen just mentioned, sort of like this this cultural approach, making sure that you've got the expectations clearly defined and that there's also, you know, an acceptance of being open and honest about it. I, I think Beyond that, you know, I look at companies that are, are doing this well, um, and there are a few that come to mind that we've worked with at Jazz HR in, in, in our past, either through partnership or otherwise, and they've got resources like free websites for their, their team members that are filled out with learning content. They, there's 
information and resources there for folks to sort of self-learn coping mechanisms. There's opportunities for sort of that self-reflection that's necessary to, to try and promote or sustain your own sort of mental well-being. Um, and, and I think that those are a couple of ideas that come to mind. But I would, I would absolutely agree that it comes from creating that safe space. And, and I also think, too, that um, there's a lot of opportunity that uh, there's a lot of opportunity for businesses today to focus on um, training their teams uh, on navigating conflict mediation and de-escalation um, because they think that even, you know, a microburst of, of um, escalated emotion, uh, you know, if it's met with the appropriate reaction is, is helpful. And I think, you know, awareness creates also uh, self-awareness to those who might be inclined to react um, uh, react adversely to certain situations. So I think there's a few different ways to handle that and a few opportunities there for folks to consider. Mm -hmm. Thank you both. We have time, I think, for just one more quick question, and then we'll have to wrap up for today. Um, in the newly remote digital world, how can IT deficiencies be overcome in a diverse work environment, which I think is kind of funny because I think a, a couple of us um, have had some IT trouble today while we've even been um, on this. Do either of you have any suggestions for navigating this new remote digital world? So I, I can start there. You know, I, I think, ironically, I can start there. <laughs> um, so I think that there's, I, I think that um, there's a wide variety of tools out there that can help with this. Uh, the irony for me is, in a lot of cases, the problems created by technology in today's world are solved by technology. Uh, and so mm -hmm. thinking about how you sort of be prepared to provide that remote support is, is really critical. Uh, and I think there's two things that you've got to plan for if you haven't already done this. The first one is, how do you troubleshoot and support remotely? It might be remote access software. It might be... Um, you know, leveraging a tool that lets you screen share a certain way. Um, it might be a tool that sits on your team's computers and allows you to push code or, or, or push scripts out that run updates automatically. I mean, there's a lot of different solutions out there that can help you based on sort of the technical aptitude of your team. Um, but I think in tandem with that, it's equally important to think about how you resolve IT issues in a crisis. Uh, and, and, and crisis is a strong word, but you know, think about how if you've got a workforce that is working entirely remotely and somebody's computer completely, completely dies, there's, there's no, no salvaging it, what's your go-to plan? How quickly can you get equipment in their hands? And what's the ramp-up time look like to get them through that learning curve of getting up to speed on a new machine? Um, being prepared for that and having, like, your in-the-event-of-emergency-break-glass plan can really save you some grief and heartache down the line because we never know when it's going to happen. Right. Well, thank you very much. Um, I want to thank everyone again for joining us today during our webinar, and um, I want to thank both for informative presentations and for everyone for being patient as we did navigate a little bit of technological uh, challenge during, our, during the course of our presentations. Um, I want to remind you, if you have any questions, you can email twh at cdc.gov, and you should all have been able to enjoy this final slide here about different ways that you can connect with our program. And with that, I'm going to say thank you, and we'll sign off for today and wish you all a safe and healthy rest of your week.